When I say genetic control, that's the belief that genes control our characters. When I say epigenetic control, it almost sounds the same, but epi means above. So when I say epigenetic control, literally it's control above the genes. And this is what we now recognize that the environment, and very specifically, our perception of the environment, changes our genetic activity. So that means, well wait, that's not a victim because I can change my environment, I can change my perception, and all of a sudden, if I can do that, then I can control my genes. Well, we're going from victim to mastery, from genetics to epigenetics. What people have to understand about epigenetics is it changes the reading of the gene. It does not change the gene. Right. If you're born with gene X, you're always going to have gene X, but how will it express itself? And I go, well, it depends on, on your life and your character, your behavior, your environment. Uh, and this is why getting a gene readout, getting your card and reading your genes. It, it actually, uh, one of the uh, uh, head uh, researchers in the Human Genome Project, upon receiving his own Gene readout. Uh, it was a quote. And he said he laughed when he read this because he said, by looking at that, I can't tell if I have blue eyes or brown eyes. I can read all the genes, but I can't tell you what the outcome is going to be because it's genes plus environment. Uh, if it was just genes, I would be able to tell you exactly here's what's going to happen. But most of that is changeable by how you how you live and where you live. And, and as a result, uh, there's only about seven diseases that are caused by one gene, such as hemophilia, uh, cerebral palsy is another one, uh, Tay-Sachs disease is one. So you got about seven major diseases, only one gene. If you got that gene, and the gene card shows it, okay, you, you know, you got that gene, you're gonna deal with it. All the other diseases are multiple genes. Cancer is a minimum of 12 to 14 genes, so it's not an accident. Uh, you, you can't change one gene and get cancer. You have to change 12 to 14 genes, and all of a sudden, then probability uh, is a chance. It's like, no, it, it, there, we are creating a cancer, and we can uncreate a cancer. People have spontaneous remissions, but they, they change it not by changing their biology, but by changing their mind. There's genes that make a physical body. So that's like the robotic, here it is, it's a machine, okay? But there are genes on how it's gonna behave and how it's gonna respond and what kind of issues it's going to face. Those are the changeable ones that we change from day to day, your behavior and the consequences of your behavior, okay? It's not changing the genes, it's changing the readout. So the simple point is, a gene is a blueprint. Right away, this is the biggest problem in the world because the idea of a gene must be an illusion to a lot of people. There's something called a gene and it turns on and off. And it goes, no, let's clear this up. A body is made out of 100,000 different protein building blocks. It's sort of like a giant Lego kit. 100,000 different pieces. You can assemble the pieces this way, make a muscle cell. Assemble them this way, make a brain cell. Different pieces, you can plug them together. The pieces are called proteins. They're very complex. The question is, where the heck do the proteins come from? And the answer is, the DNA is a blueprint to make a protein. This is where things get dicey after that for this reason. It's a blueprint. That's exactly what it is. And I say, why is it relevant? I say, well, you go into an architect's office and she's working on a blueprint. You lean over her shoulder and you say, excuse me, is your blueprint on or off? And she would look at you and go, what are you, crazy? It's a blueprint. There's no on or off. Precisely. A gene is a blueprint. It has no ability to turn itself on or off. A gene doesn't know what the hell it does. And the idea is giving all this power to a blueprint has been an error all these years. It's not the blueprint that we're concerned about. It's the contractor who reads the blueprint. And I say, well, what in my biology is the contractor? I go, the mind. A stem cell is an embryonic cell. We have billions of stem cells in our body right now. I don't care what age you are. The reason is very simple. Every one of us, every day, loses hundreds of billions of cells, normal attrition, normal death. I mean, just in the time we were talking, we probably lost a billion red cells in that time. And you gotta replace a billion red cells. Uh, uh, the, uh, the lining of the digestive tract, 20 some feet, 
of lining, the cells are replaced every three days. Well, that's, you know, nearly a trillion cells. It's like, well, every day we're losing hundreds of billions. How many days in a row can you go if you don't replace? And the answer is not very far. So I say, oh, well, we have stem cells, embryonic cells that will replace them. So that's what a stem cell is. Okay. So I put a stem cell in a Petri dish, it's embryonic cell, and I make culture medium. And this is really important because we're going to talk about the connection. The culture medium is the equivalent of blood. If I grow human cells, I look at human blood, the composition, and try to make a version of it in a lab. If I grow mouse cells, I look at mouse blood to make a medium to grow mouse cells in. So I make the medium, and since I'm making it, I can change some of the composition. I'm synthesizing it. That's what I did. Uh, so here's the story, very simple. I put one stem cell in a Petri dish by itself, and it divides every 10 or 12 hours. So first there's one, then there's two, four, eight, 16, doubling, doubling, one week. 30,000 cells in the Petri dish, but they're all genetically identical because they came from one parent. So I have 30,000 genetically identical cells. I split the cells into three Petri dishes, so I have identical, genetically identical cells in three dishes. But I changed the composition of the culture medium, a little chemistry change, in each of the dishes. So I have genetically identical cells, but slightly different culture medium. And in one set of dishes, the cells form muscle. In a second set, they form bone. In a third set, the cells form fat cells. You say, well, what controlled the fate? I say, they were all genetically identical. So it wasn't the genes. They all had the exact same genes. The only thing that was different was the environment. My research was repeatable every day, and you could predict it. The point about that is in science, prediction means you understand something. If you can predict it before you do it, then you have some insight. My predictions were always accurate. It just didn't fit the conventional storyline. Uh, and there was a choice, um, you know, recant, you know, you're a heretic, you know, recant and just say, okay, I was wrong. And I said, no, every time I was looking around, it, it, the results were coming in in different ways from different places. So I held on to that. And it took about 20 years before science owned what I was talking about and gave it the name epigenetics. That's the new science. The pharmaceutical industry uh, runs the show in medicine. And uh, if you could put this kind of healing that I'm talking about into a capsule or tablet, they'd be talking about it right now. But this is a consciousness healing and, and you can't sell it. And so what's the result? They're not interested in it. And they, through their money, which is massive, actually determine the curriculum in a medical school. Mm. Uh, and the idea is, well, what's relevant? Well, if you understand epigenetics, you don't need the pharmaceutical industry. Mm. And all of a sudden it's like, well, that's not in the interest of the, you know, one of the biggest industries on this planet to say, you can heal yourself without drugs? And I go, absolutely. 